first Friday of the month, December 1, final calendar month of the year, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Bill, good morning to you. Good morning, Rob. Great to be here. Bill, it's great to have you here. And it's wonderful to be here, Rob. Let me introduce you to the hero of the week, Delegate Mike Hyde. Good morning, Michael. Good morning, Robert. So we finally, uh, due to uh, Mike's, uh, all I can tell you is just hugeness and stepping up this week, and uh, Rodney Rockwell, our engineer, we had had some electrical issues earlier, and one of our uh, units, an UPS called an UPS, blew out earlier this week. The battery was running low, and when it does that, an alarm goes off, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, we kept zapping and getting knocked off the air. So Mike stepped up huge uh, to help out, and then Rodney finished the, uh, the work last night, and everything should be normal now and for us. Yeah, we owe yeah. Mike a great deal. And, Mike, I don't take personal offense that I <laughs> accuse you of being too late to the party last, the, last week. I was listening, and, uh, yeah, I didn't take offense at all, Bill. Yes, you I, did. <laughs> uh, the two of know. you, this, this, the love and respect, it was just... Uh, <laughs> I think we all learned something. I think Maria was taken up for me. Maria was yeah. taken No, I'm not sure. She was too busy making the buzz sounds. <laughs> well, Bill's ruthless. He doesn't toss people under the bus. He throws them overboard. Remember, yeah. he was an animal. Yeah. <laughs> Our first guest in this segment, and in the 835 segment, by the way, Steve Stolifer, president of the Jefferson County Commission. And then later in that half hour, uh, Matt Harvey, the Jefferson County prosecuting attorney, as we had some serious movement on the Jefferson County Commission issues yesterday. Uh, and uh, more on that in about half an hour. First, we bring in Dr. Rob Tudor. He is the interim provost and uh, vice president for academic affairs at Shepherd University. Rob, good morning to you. Thanks for coming in. Good morning. Glad to be here. Thank you. Great to have you. So there's been a lot going on with our universities across the country, the flagship university, the state, WVU, with the, some well-documented issues. And Shepherd had some issues as well with finances and some academic rearrangements, so to speak. If you could give us the latest update on what's going on at Shepherd. Sure, sure. So we, we started this whole process in June of, of really just uh, meeting with folks and sharing with them uh, what we had discovered um, after careful examination of, you know, going through one fiscal year and realizing that there were better ways to use the resources that we had. Mm -hmm. So we came up with a, a target of uh, finding six million dollars in savings over two years. So basically three million dollars a year. And savings is a combination of, uh, of um you know, uh, reducing expenses and also finding new sources of revenue. Mm -hmm. So we started that process in June, and uh, it's been a very, very uh, long, long ride and a lot of action working collaboratively together to make that happen. So that included um, two major projects, which was a restructuring of the university itself, all the academic units in the, in the university, and then a prioritization of all of the academic programs. What is the total pie we're talking about of cutting six million dollars out of? Total pie. Well, um, so uh, sixty percent of the university's budget is salaries and benefits, and of that sixty percent, ninety percent of that budget lies in my area in academic affairs. So, um, so the savings that we can find um, has a significant impact on on the budget overall. So, do you have a? a ballpark of what the general overall budget of Shepherd University is? Are you, are you saving, are you trying to find a $6 million savings out of $100 million of a budget? Or are you trying to find a $6 million savings out of a $50 million budget? 20? Any, uh, uh, can you help me out on that one? You know, it's a, it's a pretty complex thing. Cause uh, <laughs> I would say probably, you know, the last time I looked at the whole budget, uh, I want to say it was 54, but I, I don't hold me to that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I spent a lot of time focused on one specific area of of the the institution, you know, um, like 134 faculty sure. members. Sure, that, that does give and, us a yeah. ballpark, though. You're basically yeah. tasked with cutting about 10 percent of what your budget. I'd say you safely, yeah, about 10 percent yeah. of the budget. Yeah. Okay, yeah. And uh, from a curriculum rearrangement standpoint, mm -hmm. have, what kind of changes have you had to make there? Well, sure. So the first thing we did was it was a restructuring, right? So we we took uh, four different colleges and 15 academic units and condensed them down to three colleges and 10. And academic units um, and that meant some leadership changes some reassigned time for people for different leadership responsibilities and restructuring that and re restructuring um, how much uh, resources like salary resources were devoted to those different positions so that realized um, and that along with um, really carefully examining the operations of the Martinsburg Center and realizing that uh, you know about 
well, I guess it was about 12 years ago, uh, 10, 10 to 12 years ago when it started. Mm -hmm. um, it had a lot more robust participation, but over the time that, that that participation and interest in taking courses there has really waned. So all of that realized uh, when we were done with that, it was about six weeks of process, realized about $300,000 in savings. Uh, and rather, I don't think I mentioned that we had decided that we were going to close the Martinsburg Center effective mm -hmm. at the end of this calendar year. And the next part of that was the academic prioritization. And prioritization means you just take all of your academic programs, you lay them out on the table, and you've got, uh, you know, if you're looking at from left to right, at the end is your budget, you know, and, and it is this is like this is our our hard stopping point what can we do so we take every we took uh, uh, 42 different academic programs that we offer at Shepherd University and assess them on a bunch of criteria and the criteria are being like how many students are coming into the program what's the retention for the first to second year what's the six-year graduation rate uh, what does it cost for the faculty in those programs all those different factors associated with that. Um, do they have revenue? Do they have some, uh, external support and stuff like that? So you take all those and you compare them against each other simultaneously, which hasn't been done at Shepherd University in recent memory. Um, and it's a, it's a complicated exercise. And the, the end of that yielded us uh, about $1.08 million in targeted savings. And you say this isn't something that you did annually. This is something you did out of necessity. Absolutely. So uh, about uh, two years ago, the state of West Virginia decided that they wanted to work, rework their uh, prioritization process, or let's say simply their program review process. So every program at a university was required to go through an end of a five year review. Okay. So you take, no matter what the state institution is of higher education, you take all of your degrees and you divide them up equally and then you put them on a five year cycle. So what happens is, you know, like Shepherd University, we might have five programs evaluated five or six programs evaluated a year but they're not evaluated against the performance of all the programs they're evaluated against itself on a five-year cycle well that's great but it doesn't create a real strong motivation for change right you're not actually saying okay let's take a look at this against all of the programs let's take a look at this against what we think we're going to need in the future let's compare this to labor uh, demands to what the employers want so Two years ago, um, Shepherd University participated with other state institutions in a new process of evaluation, and that is what the state of West Virginia developed. Again, it's, it's called, you know, program review, and some places it's called academic prioritization. And the prioritization is a simultaneous looking at of all of the programs. So we used that model that was developed by the state of West Virginia and adapted it for our local use here at Shepherd. Now we were going to start engaging in this in about three years, like seriously engaging this in three years, but we used the structure for our, our examination and decision making process this year. Bill? Yeah, uh, good morning, Rob. Thanks good for morning. joining us this morning. Uh, the, all the institutions of higher learning in West Virginia are under some budget or financial pressure mm -hmm. uh, and they responded to it various ways uh, WVU being the flagship university seems to have the spotlight more directly flashed on them than others and there's been a lot of criticism about the way that the WVU approach their right size now that's the term that's always used I don't know what right sizing means but it's always used uh, what did Shepherd University do to to educate or to get buy-in from the faculty, from the staff, from the uh, the students of what had to be a very chromatic, a very kind of dark time, at least mm -hmm. if you look at WVU, it was a dark time and there's a lot of criticism being raised. What did you folks do to ensure buy-in? We made some very important decisions early on. We decided that we weren't going to bring in an external consultant uh, to to uh, to assess the programs and give us their decisions. Instead, we said, we know how this process works. There's a, a guy who's a really well-known author in academic circles, which would be comparatively really small. His name's Robert Dickinson, and he wrote this book on academic prioritization. And he is actually one of the people brought into the state of West Virginia to help develop this process. So we looked at Robert Dickinson's book um, carefully, and we, we used the structure that was developed by the state. And instead of bringing an external consultant in, we said, no, we're going to engage everybody from the start. So it started with um, 
with a group of people getting together and mapping out the timeline. And then I started weekly communications on Thursday evenings to all the faculty and staff, basically saying, this is what we're doing this week in my office, this is where we are, and this is, where we have, this is what we have going for the week ahead. And that happened every single week. And uh, it gave them timelines, it gave them updates on, <clears throat> excuse me, on the process and uh, what we had planned to do next. So, you know, so what we do is we pull this, uh, this data together, right, into reports. And so you've got 42 programs. So you put all these the different data sets on enrollment, all those different factors that I brought together that I talked about earlier. You bring all that together in these reports and you send them out to the academic units. Uh, and that would have been you send out to English and math and all those different programs, right? And it's showing them this is what your uh, four year enrollment looks like. This is what the, the demand is. This is how much it costs. Uh, this is where, um, and then so there would be a lot of uh, quantitative uh, data included in that. And then there were some quant qualitative pieces to it saying, where do you expect yourselves to go? How well do you think you're doing? So um, we sent that out to them all at once. We communicated uh, with them and then they worked in, within their academic units and then they had a month to respond to that and sent that back to us. I, sorry, I should have backed up a little bit in saying that we met with the faculty senate with the staff, with the, with the um, Student Government Association, uh, in various groups to share with them exactly what the process was going to be, why we we're engaged in the process, what the timeline was, and what the expectations results would be. And we repeatedly met with them. When we, uh, so we sent out these, the data sets on September 1st, we gave them a month to reply, and then in that two weeks between October 1st and October 15th, we met every single day. The deans met, the, we met with department chairs, we met with individuals, really just getting feedback and talking about, we're gonna have to make some really difficult decisions here uh, in, in, in the next two weeks. And then we followed up with that, with the report that went out on October 15th. And then we had about another three more weeks where I had open sessions with all the students. I met with the Student Government Association, continued to meet with the Faculty Senate and with the different departments as well. So the communication process was, uh, was a key decision that, uh, that our president and, and the executive leadership team had committed to from the start. And that we wanted to handle it locally. And we believed that we could use the framework that was established by the state of West Virginia uh, Higher Education Policy Commission and adapt that. And the acceptance of uh, uh, the university as a, as a whole, how's the, how has the acceptance been? Well, I, on the whole, it's been good. You know, it's been, it's been good. Everybody understands uh, we have been uh, undergoing, until just the last couple of years, we saw a reduction in uh, enrollment by about uh, 36% uh, over about a 10 year period from 2012 to 2022. And then in 2022, we had engaged in a series of very strategic marketing and messaging efforts to get new students to come to Shepherd University. And we saw a loss that stopped and we saw a slow upward trend. And we've seen an upward trend again this year. On, in addition to that, we've seen a two year trend in increase in retention. And that's important because you've got those students there and you want to keep them and you want to help them realize what they came to Shepherd University to do, right? Um, so generally, everybody understood that it needed to happen. But no one wants to see anybody, any programs reduced, and certainly no one wants to see any teachers leave or any staff leave. But that's a reality that we have to understand is going to happen when you're trying to right-size an institution. Mike Heights. Well, good morning. Um, good morning. There's, uh, there's been a lot of people that have um, said that the legislature is to blame for this, that the, the underfunding of higher education um, in recent years is, is what has pushed this. Um, I listened to an interview of Gordon Gee, and Gordon said, no, that's not true, that, that what has happened, <clears throat> excuse me, what has happened is we have um, not kept up with the current climate in higher education. We have not looked internally to our own issues um, for a long time, and, and that's what we need to do. That's what this review is about, is about looking internally and finding where we're inefficient and trying to, to get those efficiency again. Would you agree with that assessment, or do you think the legislature's underfunding of higher education is the problem and what has uh, elicited this issue? I think it's a, it's a little bit of both, actually, yeah. 
I would say that, that yes, uh, the generally, nationally speaking, states have invested less money in higher education. But not all higher education is funded by the state. There's, I worked at a private institution for six years before coming here. So we have the same problem in private institutions that we have in state institutions. So I would say it would be helpful if the state would, would not have continued to divest in higher education. It certainly exacerbated the problem. Um, and he's right. Uh, uh, Dr. Gee is right. He's uh, correct about um, institutions need to look inward. Uh, institutions are really complex uh, enterprises. We don't we don't we don't call them businesses. We call them enterprises because they're so uh, multifaceted and, and and the many different things you've got you've got teaching and you've got auxiliary services which is like uh, uh, the room room and board and then you have um, external groups that come and use the campus and you have summer camps and you have all these different things. You have professional continuing education that that aren't related to degree programs. All these things are part of the higher education enterprise, right? Well, as we see enrollment contracting, and if you're enrollment driven, it means that you don't have enough money coming in from an external source, be it, be it private funding or from the state. You don't have enough of that coming in to, to carry you through the really difficult times, so you have to really focus on enrollment. We're optimistic the, uh, in that we believe that enrollment's going to turn around, so we're not always willing to look at the complicated enterprise and say, we need to make some cuts, and those cuts are going to be based on not only where we are now, but where we think we're going to be in five years. And that is not something that people like to do. I like it because um, I've always been um, um, uh, interested in puzzles, right, and how complex organisms work. But um, and, and I think anybody who finds himself in that type of in that type of leadership position is usually attracted to complex puzzles and such like that. But that's not common in higher education. It's not common to look at the resources that you have, the limited resources, and then carefully project forward and think ahead five and 10 years. You, you mentioned enrollment and retention, and you said that the trend the last two years has been seeing an improvement in both enrollment and, re, in, and retention, mm -hmm. or new students coming in and retaining the old ones. Uh, Marshall University has seen the same has made the same observation. Uh, WVU has not. Uh, what about the other schools? Do you have any sense at all whether they are more in line with what you and Marshall have observed, or are they still eroding students, uh, the, uh, the number of students? You know, I, I really can't speak to the other schools with their enrollment. I, I did, however, uh, as you mentioned, I'm interim provost, so I started this role on June 5th. And I did go in October to the state meeting of two and four year institutions, uh, Shepherd, uh, excuse me, uh, state of West Virginia for two and four year institutions, the academic officers, uh, that would be provosts and, and, and people who, who run academic affairs. And I was very relieved to hear that this problem is everyone's problem. Every single person is dealing with this. Um, and so I, I would say that Marshall's doing well, we're doing well, I think we're doing, we're heading in a very positive direction. Um, but uh, the, the, the fight isn't over uh, to really carefully examine where we are right now with relation to the, the money coming in and uh, what our expenses are and where we think we're going to be in five years. There are only, um, so there are only 15,000 uh, high school graduates uh, coming out of West Virginia this year. And of that, 7,500 of them are expected to go to college, okay? Four and year and two year combination. Four year there. and two year, and not all of them are expected to go to college within the state of West Virginia. There's a whole, I used to have this breakdown written on a card on my desk. <laughs> I wish I'd brought it with me today because I'd love to be able to share the breakdown. But so let's say best case scenario, none of those students go outside of the state of West Virginia Every two and four year institution of higher education is competing for 7,500 students in the state of West Virginia. What percentage of your enrollment is out of state? Uh, 40%. 40%. Yeah. So uh, as you make your calculations going forward, uh, you also have to calculate what the national birth rate is and what mm -hmm. you think it might be, too. And we've had a flat or declining birth rate uh, for some time. Mm hmm. I don't know if that's picked up in, in the latest studies in terms of birth rates or whatever, but what have you observed as you're looking forward? Because what happens on the birth rate today affects every college 18 years from now. There's a, um, 
excellent group in uh it's called uh, we call it wiki um and it's western uh i don't know what the i stands for commission on higher education um but they do uh census and projection trends for enrollment and they've always been really consistent on their predictions so i remember in 2010 when i was telling my colleagues we just have two more yet uh, two more years left of growth and then we're going to head down a, a steep enrollment dive nationally and it started in uh, the northeast and new england and the mid-atlantic states and then it moved its way westward and the only states that were safe from the enrollment cliff that we went down starting in 2012 uh, were uh, georgia texas and florida they are now in the flat or declining college uh, going rate and that just means that about you know 20 years ago about you you count back 20 years from where you are people started having fewer kids mm -hmm. so um i look at those resources very carefully and i look at those reports uh and and just to see what the what the trends are going to be we are not expected to have uh, a significant increase in enrollment in a long, uh for quite a while uh it's probably not until it's going to continue this way until i retire probably where it'll be it'll be flat possibly steadily increase um but not a significantly increase uh, you, a lot of this is new students coming in but the big yeah. part is retention yes and what have you done specifically to retain the students that's a really good question so um dr amy dewitt is uh she's in charge of our academic success center so we have a couple of key programs we have really really good advising we train our teachers to advise students and we have professional advisors as well and some of them are dedicated to specific disciplines like nursing and business and uh, stem and the arts and humanities so we have uh, we have a career uh, ad advisor on campus as well we have uh, so advising is, is key we have a student success center where students who are having difficulty with uh, let's say either either their assignments or juggling their schedule whatever they can come into the student success center in the student center sit down one-on-one -on -one with a coach and say these are the specific problems that I'm having with my uh, with with my college education at this point can you help me sort through it and I've seen it first hand I have a student that I mentor uh, right now who uh, I said when I when I when I entered into this mentorship relationship with him I said I need you to promise me the moment that you hit a rough patch you're gonna reach out to me and I'm gonna get you those resources that you need and he said I promise you and he did and within a day he had a bunch of people reaching out to him and say you need to talk to a counselor here you go we we'll set up the appointment he had it set up within 24 hours you need to uh, sit down with somebody and look at your schedule here you go you need somebody to help you communicate with your teachers and help you figure out your assignments and turning them in just a little bit late here you go and they made it happen i just had lunch with him yesterday and he i said so how are you doing he says i am going to be successful this semester so that's part of retention um we also have a trio program for first uh first generation college students that um helps mentor them and give them coaching and academic and life skills success to get through uh, to get through their college experience as well. When you talk about enrollment, you talk about these trends that you're looking at, mm -hmm. and you say, you know, we went down for a period of time, and now we're trending back up. Some people may say, you know, if you look at, at COVID, that, that explains a lot of these trends. You see, you saw a down um, sizing because of, of COVID. You see this uptick because we've come out of COVID for the past two years. Mm -hmm. So everybody would expect an increase in enrollment um, after that. Um, I, I do the same thing in business. I look at trends, you know, for my business. And when I do it, I sort of throw out those years. You know, and I go back to the 2018, 2019 yeah. and say, all right, let's compare where we are now and what we're doing now compared to 18, 19 mm -hmm. um, and just throw out those those COVID years altogether. Um, do you do that as well when you're looking at these trends and trying to plot forward? And do you and do you put any stock in the fact that there has been a recent push to tell kids coming out of high school you don't have to go to college <laughs> trade schools are just as good and pay just as much um, and you don't have to devote all that money to college do you see first the trends and then the issue about trade schools yeah it's it's interesting that you say that because i was just doing a, a i presented a a study on uh, classroom usage trends and class trends to all of my colleagues. I released uh, uh, seven semesters worth of information, and that includes summer semesters. And 
someone asked me, why didn't you go back farther than that? And I said, because of COVID. Everything was different in COVID. We couldn't predict what was going to happen. People were choosing to just step out of their college process or step away from college altogether. So I don't, I don't uh, include the COVID years when I am, uh, when I'm trying to examine the data and then predict forward what's going to happen. Yes, that's correct. Um, and then the other part of the question was, uh, Trade schools. Oh, trade schools, yeah. yeah. So that is a really interesting problem for all of us. Now, I'm a first-generation college student. I came from a working-class family. My stepdad worked in construction. My mom went to trade school to become a secretary until the advent of computers when secretaries were, were not needed as, you know, as, as, uh, as, uh, as much as they were before. So I was the only kid in my family to go to college, and I worked my way through college, you know. And um, so I... I'm a personal testament to to the value of education, like and the fact that it provides you incredible social mobility to move things forward in your life. To, but it's not an easy journey, right? It's an investment, and so that's what we're fighting against right now. Because the cost of higher education, be it a two year institution or four year institution, has far outpaced inflation and earnings over the last twenty years. So. Everybody is right to be looking at going to school and saying, what do I want from this investment? They're correct. And I think two-year institutions are a viable option, and I think trade schools are a viable option. The most important thing I think of from my background and my personal experience is that any kind of education that you can get for yourself will mean that you're going to have more choices in life. And getting a four-year degree means that your choices are going to be significantly better. It's going, the best thing that can happen from getting a four-year degree is the flexibility of options that you can have with your life that you don't see when you're 18 to 22 years old. You just don't see it. I, that's what, um, one of the pr things that bothers me, uh, now I'm a person who's worked in arts administration, who's worked in the arts and in teaching my, my entire life. Now, my business experience and my math experience and my interest in econo uh, economics has informed my ability to 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 uh, to operate really well in leadership. Right, my background's in music, but I've been working in in, in nonprofit administration my whole life. The fact that I've been able to move around and be fascinated by these complex organisms and to project ahead and do budget analysis and all these things is the fact that my entire education is based in a liberal arts education. I took science and history and psychology and mathematics and that foundation allowed me to become extremely able to just com to pivot at many times in my life. And that is a really hard sell for an 18 year old. Yeah, that's true. Dr. You Tudor, know? on that note, we're out of time. 